Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the World Citizens, um, I'm sorry, welcome to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Uh, today is April the 7th, 2022, and I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director. I'm joined by Gail Hughes, who's our book club coordinator, who does all the work in the background, as she's waving over there, uh, to, um, to keep us alive and keep the group going. Um, and also by Drea Bergman, who is our new uh, programs and campaigns director, and this whole uh, program, as well as all the others, come under her department. Um, so, uh, and then we have a number of board people here as well. So, um, this is our fourth out of six sessions reading the Politics of World Federation by Joseph Barada, and we are pleased once again to have Joseph join us um, for Chapter Seventeen on Cord Meyer. Uh, we'll proceed as usual with Joseph pointing out what he feels to be the highlights and the main takeaways from that chapter, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, if you haven't already, I ask everyone to go on mute um, and remain on mute when you're not speaking so we don't hear all the background noise and the phones ringing and all that. And you're welcome to use the chat feature if you want to communicate with each other or say something to the group but we won't be formally monitoring the chat and then asking Joseph questions that come in the chat. That will happen live during the, the, the Q&A period after Joseph's presentation. We'll stop at about 10 minutes before the end of the session for any announcements. So if you are promoting an event, writing a book or anything that you want to announce, please hold that for the end for that period. Um, also, since we're coming near the end of reading this book, um, Gail is going to talk a little bit at the end about our schedule for the next book and what some of the possibilities are for that. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, very likely people will be joining us late. That always happens, one or two people. Um, if we don't recognize them, uh, I will stop the show at an appropriate moment just to check in with them and make sure they actually belong um, in, this, um, in this session, um, and they're not a Zoom bomber or someone trying to hack us or, or something of that sort. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Joseph. Take it away. Uh, good morning, everybody. At this time of Russian war in Ukraine, it may seem that history has nothing to, to teach us. We may be witnessing a major shift in European and world order. The recent WFM exercises on a theory of change are confronting such shifts. But again, I would like to ask you to try to get a little perspective on events by looking back at how an organization like yours, United World Federalists Inc. tried to deal with world events of its time, uh, particularly the new US policy of containment of communism and the threat of World War III. Please hold your questions about Ukraine until after those who have read the chapter have asked theirs about the history. I noticed from last month's meeting that some of you submitted rather lengthy chat questions. I cannot field chat questions at the same time I'm listening to verbal uh, questions and trying to compose my mind uh, uh, to form useful responses. These, those questions do not survive in the recording of the Zoom meeting. So please copy and paste your questions uh, into an email to me for, for an answer. Write uh, Joseph Barata at mac, M-A-C dot com. United World Federalist Inc. organized at Asheville, North Carolina in 1947 was the leading mass membership political action organization working in the United States for the official establishment of world federal government. It was not a 501c3 educational organization, but a public corporation, hence the Inc, designed to change domestic opinion and thus influence legislation and elect supportive representatives and senators to bring about a fundamental change in US foreign policy. UWF's aim was in an early statement to elect in this country 
a national government that will put out its full efforts to get world government. It operated in a period of historical opportunity after the Second World War. The founding of the United Nations already demonstrating its inability to keep the peace and the first use in anger of atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Its purpose can be captured in a formula drawn originally from Grenville Clark. There can be no peace without justice, no justice without law, no law without government. I'd like to repeat that, and I would recommend you memorize it. There can be no peace without justice, no justice without law, no law without government. UWF maintained truths that are still fundamental for world peace. UWF was never a political party, though that was a hope of some of the more radical younger peoples. UWF remained a nonpartisan, conservative, profoundly critical pressure group in the mainstream of American politics. By the time of its first annual convention in St. Louis, Missouri, on 1 November 1947, UWF had weathered its startup problems, had a firm membership of 16,017 branches and 315 chapters, and, pro and proposed a budget for 1948 of half a million dollars. Much of the credit went to UWF's young, 26, able, well-connected, and very effective new president, Cord Meyer Jr. He had served with the 22nd Marine Regiment in the assaults on Eniwetok and Guam, where he was wounded in the face by a Japanese hand grenade and lost an eye. Some vivid wartime letters of his published in the Atlantic in 1944 brought him to the attention of Harold Stassen, former governor of Minnesota and perennial presidential candidate. Meyer was invited to be Stassen's aide at the San Francisco conference on the UN charter in 1945. After the conference, Meyer published an article on the inadequacies of the UN Charter, establishing himself as an informed and mature advocate of world government. As a wounded veteran and an advocate of world legal institutions to prevent another war, he possessed a peculiar personal authority, which many perceived on contact with him. That young man has the best mind, Stassen once said, of any young man in America. Meyer was invited to the Dublin Conference of late 1945. His logic and seriousness impressed such leading internationalists as Grenville Clark, Thomas K. Finletter, Norman Cousins, and Emery Reeves. He made similar impressions at the Rollins College Conference in early 1946. The pattern became a kind of legend. Some very important person would meet him, think he was a bright young man uh, who should get on in the world, and then suggest another important person he should meet. Through such connections, Meyer became a board member of Americans United for World Government, World Federalist USA, the Massachusetts Committee for World Federation, and Student Federalists the constituent organizations of United World Federalists. He also became a member of the National Planning Committee under veteran Charles Bolte of the New American Veterans Committee, where he was instrumental in setting its policy in favor of world government, opposed to the American Legion and the veterans of foreign wars. Hence, it was natural for the Executive Council of UWF in May 1947 to choose Meyer for their president. Someone objected that he was perhaps too young and inexperienced to take on the presidency of an organization aiming to move the United States and then the whole world toward the establishment of world federal government. To this, the New York attorney and later popular UWF parliamentarian 
AJG Priest replied, too young? May I point out that Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison did their best work before they reached their 30s. So Meyer was elected as a president to run the show as Upshur Evans, a young Gulf oil executive was chosen as executive director to run the shop. As a young executive at UWF headquarters in New York, Meyer was unsparing of himself, exacting of others. He made about 200 speaking engagements all over the country. His asking fee was $150, but he often took less, 75 or $50, all turned over to UWF. During an early funding crisis, Meyer led the staff in reducing his own salary from $13,000 to $8,500. When he was in town, his secretary gave him three or four appointments each day, fundraising meetings, interviews, talks with casual acquaintances met on trips. And Cord, who never insisted that callers come to him, would go uncomplaining to whatever address the secretary gave him. Back in the office, young Meyer saw a constant traffic of staffers go by his desk. He personally approved every plan and publicly and publicity release to go out from headquarters. A policy speech took him about the same time as a courtesy note. He never indulged in social lunches, reserving that time for business and usually the cocktail hour too. He was an excellent parliamentarian some who worked under him found him cold, even Prussian. But there can be no doubt that Kordmeyer was a resourceful, courageous, and persuasive leader of the movement, sincerely devoted to the cause of limited world government. Your contribution to our conference last Saturday, wrote one listener, has produced many comments appreciative of both the manner and the matter of your talk. We are grateful. Almost immediately in mid-1947, the first World Federalist Resolutions were introduced into Congress. One was supported by freshman Richard Nixon. It was the resolution of the, um, of, uh, the, um, the um, American Legion. Um, another was introduced into the United Nations General Assembly by Argentina calling for a general conference to amend the charter in accordance with Article 109. It appeared just after the X article by George Kennan in Foreign Affairs, which was the Truman administration's public defense of its new administration policy. A profound debate began in, on the future of the US foreign policy. To complicate UWF's minimalist program, about the same time in mid-1947, the University of Chicago's Committee to Frame a World Constitution under Robert M. Hutchins and G.A. Borgesa began publishing its maximal world government journal, Common Cause. The radical students and veterans at Northwestern University, the World Republic Boys, as they were soon called, were very attracted to maximalism and to the desperate project of Henry Usborne in England, World People's Constitutional Convention. Clarence Streit of Atlantic Union was beginning to edit his book, Union Now, so that the Soviet Union replaced Hitlerite Germany as the tyranny to be opposed by, United, by the United Democracies. The World Federalist Movement split in this early period, prominent leaders were attracted to the movement. Henry Stimson, former Secretary of State and Secretary of War, wrote a follow-up article in Foreign Affairs for October 1947, corrective of Kennan's article. The challenge to Americans. Stimson reminded the citizenry that American policy should always bear in mind 
the, quote, final goal. He wrote, lasting peace and freedom cannot be achieved until the world finds a way toward the necessary government of the whole. It is important that this should be widely understood and efforts to spread such understanding are commendable." Unquote. I'd like to just repeat that first line of uh, Stimson's article. Lasting peace and freedom cannot be achieved until the world finds a way toward the necessary government of the whole. As UWF prepared for its first annual convention in November, 1947, there was some effort to invite General of the Army Dwight Eisenhower, then being courted by both the Republicans and the Democrats for President of the United States as keynote speaker. Ike was on record as understanding the project of World Federation. As he stated in his memoirs, Crusade in Europe quoted at the beginning of this chapter. But in the end, UWF had to be content with a written message from Albert Einstein conveyed by atomic scientist Harrison Brown. Then in February 1948, preceding the first congressional hearings on what grew to be 16 World Federalist bills, Grenville Clark, U.S. statesman incognito and colleague of Henry Stimson, made a major address to the New York City Bar Association on a general East-West settlement. In the deterioration of international relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, Clark saw a proof that anarchy is the cause of war for American policy containment seemed only to provoke a worse Russian reaction, anti-Americanism. Clark could not believe that all Americans were benevolent while the Russians were solely at fault. Clark was answered fairly by Clark Eichelberger, executive director of the American Association for the United Nations, who argued realistically enough, if dully, that the UN was the best world government attainable at the time. A review conference to transform the UN into a federal world government was in 1948, or the immediate future, he said, doomed to fail. Grenville Clark's speech was the most articulate and highest level analysis supportive of UWF's advocacy of world government at the time. Unfortunately, history soon overtook the Federalists. Later in February 1948, the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia, alarmed by that country's inclination to participate in the Marshall Plan, launched a coup d'etat. The aging Edvard Beneš, father of Czechoslovakia in 1918, was forced to accept a majority communist government, and Jan Masaryk, son of Tomas Masaryk, another founder, apparently was thrown to his death from an upstairs window, extinguishing what was left of that liberal democratic state. Most people in the West took the Czech coup as final proof of Stalin's aggressive intentions. Soon the little idealistic world federalist movement was overtaken by talk of preventive war while the USA had a monopoly of atomic bombs and its World Federalist resolutions in Congress just served to soften up the remnants of isolationism in the Senate, which passed the Vandenberg resolution on the North Atlantic Treaty. The treaty was duly signed and ratified in 1949 and the military organization NATO became a reality later that year. NATO then was not a universal collective security organization within a minimal world government of a reformed United Nations, but a permanent US entangling alliance <clears throat> uh, with Europe. 
Its purpose, said Britain's Lord Ismay, the first secretary general, was to keep the Russians out. The Americans in and the Germans down. I have a chapter on the congressional hearings in 1948, 49, and 50, and an appendix of all the historic resolutions of those revolutionary times, but I have not distributed them to you since the political situation is adequately uh, treated in this chapter. Fear of war destroyed all hope for the necessary government of the whole. Everything reverted to nationalist traditions. But there is one story about the hearings that is short and radiant. At one point, after Secretary of State George Marshall came to quash the World Federalist Bills, Cordmeyer was asked, what if you could make only one change? Meyer replied, do not attempt to abolish the veto. Make the General Assembly representative of people. That is, leave the great powers in place in the Security Council, but introduce democracy into the General Assembly. That is the key to UN effectiveness. Lastly, I should say something about Cord Myers joining the CIA in 1951. He left the presidency of UWF in 1949 when Alan Cranston took over. Myers' disappearance into the government, the CIA, was only revealed in 1967 in a story in Ramparts. Most old world Federalists took his action as a deep betrayal of all his ideals. And indeed, while in the CIA throughout the Cold War, Meyer understood his role to subvert the laws of other countries. But Meyer's case was not untypical if it was extreme. By 1951, in the midst of the Korean War, there was no hope for World Federation. It was time to face reality, the title of Cord Meyer's memoirs. The world had divided into two. Now was the time to come to the aid of one's country. McCarthyism was searching for disloyal Americans. The Cold War was the new international reality. Preparations for World War seemed only prudent. Every prominent world federalist laid low and tried to live down his past. Let me give you three examples. E.B. White of the New Yorker, who wrote the most droll little book about world government, The Wild Flag, 1943-46. The one book about world government that can bring a smile to your face. Never again wrote of it and ended his life with children's books like Charlotte's Web. Mortimer Adler of the Chicago Committee, who had predicted world government in five years, prepared his Syntopicon of the Great Ideas for the Great Books of the Western World in 1952. There were 102 of them. Angel was a great idea, but not world federal government. The great educator never again spoke of his former advocacy. Harris Wofford, one of the most brilliant of student federalists who understood world federation as the revolution to establish politically the brotherhood of man was overexposed until he re-emerged re in 1961 as a director in Africa of President Kennedy's Peace Corps. When he was briefly appointed a senator of Pennsylvania, he hid his past advocacy of World Federation. And I myself, when contacted by Republicans looking for dirt, shielded him from embarrassing inquiries. 
world federalism was impolitic. Well, that concludes my remarks on this chapter. And I invite uh, questions, uh, particularly upon this history of it as it relates to CGS um, uh, first, and then we can widen the discussion if you wish uh, to uh, the events in Ukraine. Great, thank, thank you so much, Joseph, for that, uh, again, penetrating analysis of that period of time and the activities that were going on there. So um, as Joseph said at the beginning, I want to uh, re just remind people to stay with questions on the chapter first. So we'll go through those and clear the decks on those. Um, I'm remi again, reminding people to raise their cyber hands, which you can get to uh, by, br by bringing your cursor to the bottom. You should see a reactions uh, button light up. And then if you click on that, raising your hand is one of the options. And then I'll take questions first from those who raised their cyber hand after we've gone through all those. If folks can't find it or whatever, I'll take any raised hands in the flesh. Uh, but I already see a cyber hand up. So let me start with Gail. Gail, you're still on mute. I, I'm glad you said something about Cord Meyer becoming director of the CIA. Uh, that wasn't in the chapter, but it was something that I really wondered about. And I see he was the director after he'd been with WFI. But um, I'm wondering if you can say something about, I mean, I don't know what he was like as director of the CIA, but the policies he was promoting through WFI and the policies he was promoting through the CIA, um, do you know anything about it? And I also noticed that his, he had an ex-wife who was a mistress of John Kennedy's and she was murdered in 1964. So uh, there's some colorful things in his life. I, I don't know if it had anything to do with his role and her knowing something, you know, that she was murdered for simply because she was a mistress or Anyhow, I'm wondering if you know anything more about his role with the CIA. Um, well, Meyer has written a memoir called Facing Reality. And he talks, uh, he writes about um, making this transition from uh, world, United World Federalists to the CIA. Um, he, um, <clears throat> The way I understand it, Meyer truly uh, understood the proposal of world federalism. He, he knew that modern states are based upon values, rather in, intangible and uh, easily uh, broken values like um, <clears throat> government established for the protection of human liberty, you know, um, and um, the right of the people when their rights are threatened uh, to uh, change their government and lay its foundations on such principles and organize its, its powers in such forms as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And as he looked about uh, the world in 1940, well, started in 40, well, before 44 even, but um, he, he realized that uh, many uh, states had, had formed republics which were based upon values uh, just as intangible and fragile as these. So in facing reality, he actually describes his work in the CIA in Federalist principles. Since other countries, particularly those labeled enemy countries, were based on just as fragile a found foundations, such as a worker and peasant state designed to liberate the, the humanity from the 
powers of capitalism, his task was to subvert the laws of those countries. So he, uh, in good conscience, as, as a cold warrior, uh, he set out to uh, subvert the laws, the principles of these other countries. I uh, believe that Meyer rose to the number three position in the CIA and he, uh, he was in charge of operations, which includes assassinations. Um, I don't know any details and I'm not even interested in it, but um, it, it is very troubling. He was um, trying to defend the United States at a time of world disunity. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Grenville Clark had the same motivation. Uh, he didn't go as far as joining the CIA. He remained our, uh, a believer in world federalism, but it was to save the United States. And uh, you can ask the same question of Grenville Clark. Uh, why would a man who had been so part of, so much a part of the war machine in the United States, why after 1945 did Clark uh, advocate world federal government? It's, it was to, these people were patriotic. Now, um, Uh, this, uh, and uh, so bear in mind that uh, Meyer did not join the CIA directly after being president of UWF. That took a couple of years um, in 1951. And it was a secret until 1967. Uh, I interviewed him um, uh, after he had retired from the CIA. Um, now, um, as far as Mary Meyer goes, I have to tell you, <laughs> when writing a book, it's always good to get a little, little sex in the, in the, in the story. <laughs> and um, actually, I look for this high and low uh, because I thought if I could add a few details, it's like this detail that Richard Nixon supported the World Federalist Bill in 1948, okay? And uh, there's a story too about Ronald Reagan he gave $200 to the World Republic Boys uh, in 1947, I think it was. It just shows you how um, fluid these ideas were in those days and how, it, how people were baffled by the atomic bomb and they truly wished to find some way to control this tremendous force that threatened um, world destruction. Um, and uh, Mary Meyer, I must tell you, it was as, it was just kind of like a a marriage made in heaven. Mary Meyer was the granddaughter of Clifford of Gifford Pinchot, the um, great forester of the United States in in the Progressive period. Uh, and when um, she agreed to to marry this dashing um, Marine Corps veteran, uh, uh, Cord Meyer, their wedding was presided over by none other than Reinhold Neighbor. Uh, this was a, a big uh, society wedding. Um, now it's true that there was um, a suspicion that she and President Kennedy had a, at least one liaison. Um, however, I can tell you that even Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, who dug up all this dirt about President Kennedy, um, he never mentions Mary Meyer. Uh, there's been a book about her and I've read this book and it's just, just junk, all kinds of unsupported accusations. But, uh, it seems that um, there was uh, some contact with the president and uh, Cord Meyer didn't like it. And then there was a, a, an accident at their home when Mary, um, she had two sons. And uh, 
she drove their car over the boys and killed them. This is odd. And of course, people are suspicious. Um, Cordmeyer was at the height of his powers in the CIA. And uh, the CIA, uh, you may know, occasionally gets rid of people by assassinating them. And people suspected that he uh, assassinated Mary. There is absolutely the most, the littlest possible this, uh, evidence for this. And I have refused to, I mean, this is the first time I've ever mentioned it in public. I just, this is not a story that is worth our attention. And um, I, it's very probably barely true at all. Uh, and uh, Seymour Martin Lipset found lots of women who claimed to have affairs with the president, but not Mary Meyer. So I leave that up to, um, I, I hope to just plain uh, forgetfulness. A dreadful story and the, the worst of, is, here's my sex story, but this is not worthy of us. Another question, please. Okay, well, it, it's difficult to follow any conversation on sex and death, but I will try. Uh, I put myself in the queue before. So, um, so yeah, so my, my question is, as I read that chapter, I, I was, you know, time and time again struck by the parallels between what was happening then and what's happening now. And th there were two that really jumped out at me, although the, the, there were several, is one is your section, what about Russia? Um, um, I mean, today, if you were to write that section, it would probably probably be what about Russia and China and the spread of autocracy. Um, but that was one thing that just leaped off, off the page to me. And the second was when I read the, you had a few descriptions of Cord Meyer's strategy, the kinds of things he was doing to promote the work and where, you know, the media he was going to and all that. And I was reading and I think, my God, that's what we're trying to do. It just seemed like that was a real parallel as well. Although he didn't have social media or websites, so we got an extra edge. But uh, but a lot of the other stuff was is what we're looking to do. So my question is, is in those areas or in any other areas, are there lessons from the past that we should really be heeding today uh, in our work? And if that's too much away from, you know, like you said, you want to stay on the chapter. If that's too much of a transition, we can take that question later. Uh, but it, it really grabbed me. You know, what are the lessons that we should not ignore uh, from that era that we should really be applying today? Thank you. Very good, Bob. No, let's go ahead. Um, uh, I know you have uh, a copy of the whole book and uh, David has one too. Uh, there's a whole chapter on what about Russia? Um, 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 it's not a black and white story and Russia is not entirely to blame for the Cold War. Um, the basic, uh, there was a response from, um, <coughs> from uh, Andre Gromyko to the World Federalist proposals of the 40s. And uh, it was that at that time, the Soviet government uh, could not uh, rely upon majorities in uh, a democratic uh, United Nations uh, to uh, pr pr protect the Soviet Union. Um, and so they hang on to the veto since they were a minority uh, power. Um, But um, Cord Meyer, as you point out in, in this chapter, uh, had to deal with this question of Russia. And remember, he was a minimalist, uh, that is, but also a universalist. He, he believed sincerely and deeply that uh, the wartime uh, alliance with the Soviet Union 
should have been should have uh, been uh, preserved. And um, <clears throat> the United Nations as a universal organization should have been made to work. He did not think that powers beyond those to control the atomic bomb and maybe uh, all other arms could be vested in a democratic United Nations ruling by majority rule. He was a minimalist, but a universalist. That really made him quite different from the architects of, the, of American foreign policy after 1947. Um, now, um, as for the, his strategy, uh, again, I would like to repeat what I said uh, uh, in earlier meetings. <clears throat> Meyer was leading a, a domestic organization uh, and his purposes were to um, affect legislation in in Congress. Um, it was a, a political corporation, a public corporation, not tax exempt, um, who used its money drawn from dues to uh, lobby uh, in state legislatures as well as the Congress of the United States. He was trying to form a domestic opinion strong enough to influence our representatives in government. Um, I think that's still your strategy. And uh, I wonder, um, uh, uh, oh, I really wonder what's gonna become of CGS because um, there's so little of, of public opinion uh, already prepared for your, uh, your kinds of uh, solutions, global solutions. Um, I don't think you have 315 chapters scattered around the country. No. And uh, I don't think you, uh, the, uh, the world movement consists of uh, 72 organizations in 22 countries. It's not there. So you, as far as influencing events by forming an articulate and informed public opinion, um, uh, you'll have to find new means, I think. Uh, one of them, uh, I've been wrestling with this in my mind for several years, but um, uh, I think you, you should only aim at uh, a, a leading a journal or a website where articulate uh, people uh, could uh, maintain the, uh, an argument or a vision of uh, the necessary uh, changes that the world must undergo uh, to uh, establish lasting peace. Um, but uh, what I would like, uh, you speak of the lessons of the past. Um, what I really would like you to appreciate is how courageous these people were and, and how, um, innovative uh, they were at every point. And uh, they did get resolutions into the Congress and there were public debates in, uh, in Congress. That's quite an achievement. Even if um, the actual content of the proposals, including the one that uh, Nixon had supported um, is so, um, is so is merely so, I call it hortatory. Uh, I fear, well, uh, as far, uh, let me just say about Ukraine, I fear that what is happening is that uh, all the progress of the last 75 years since the end of the Second World War is being undone. Uh, I fear that um, not only are we entering a new Cold War, but we're already at war with, with uh, 
uh, with Russia. We're, we're, uh, we're not sending troops, but we're sending lethal weaponry. And I'm, I'm fearful for the United States. I, President Biden could not pass his blue collar blueprint to rebuild America, but he can find $800 million to buy Stinger missiles and um, Javelin missiles uh, to give to Ukraine. Uh, there are events that are conceivable that will overtake your movement. Uh, I think that, uh, I, I mean, I, I, that's one lesson I learned from this. The, the World Federalists were clear headed and they were brave and they were determined to solve their, this problem, but they were overtaken by events. National leaders never lost control of their publics and of events. We reverted to traditional sovereign state conduct very quickly after winning this war against the fascism. And uh, it looks, uh, I, I, I don't wanna speculate about what may happen next, but I'm gonna have to leave that in the air. Um, but we uh, suspect you all have your own notions. Uh, we're, uh, we are really at the point where we're waiting on the next event. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm deeply, deeply troubled. Uh, I think globalization, which was making such progress, you see all these companies that work with the Russians and they're, they're trying to break it down. We better have another question, please. Okay, Maybe. Let, me, let, me, let me do a final check to see if there are any further questions on the chapter itself. And then, cause we've already kind of transitioned into the greater picture. So first, are there any questions about the chapter and then we'll just open it up uh, for anything else relevant to our work. So either cyber hands or flesh hands, going once, going twice. Okay, well then we'll open it up. Uh, uh, to Ron you. Glossop would like to make a comment. Oh, terrific, Ron, go right ahead. I just want, first of all, to really thank Joseph for this really important information he's been giving us. I'm wondering if you would like to say something about Gorbachev and his influence in Russia and his supporting us, really, if, <laughs> if he just had some more influence. <laughs> so what did Joseph think about Gorbachev? Um, well, you really should pay attention to Gorbachev. Don't forget, he ended the Cold War and he's still alive and he writes books. Yeah. Uh, he has, uh, I've read his memoirs, which are very instructive. And also the latest book is called uh, The New Russia. It's about Putin's Russia. Yes. And uh, you'll discover that he sides with Putin about the taking of Crimea. Uh, he uh, is fairly articulate about the threat of NATO to uh, Russia's defenses. Um, and um, there was a, uh, uh, it's a, <clears throat> amazing that uh, a man should come up through the communist party system and come out um, so wise uh, as world statesman. Um, there's even a, a, a remark in his address to the United Nations in 1988, in which he uh, mentions the, uh, the possibility of a government of the world. Uh, all that has been that's the kind of thing that's been destroyed uh, lately. Um, that kind of uh, long-term vision, what uh, Henry Stimson called the, the uh, government of the whole. I would recommend to any of you, if you wanna sort of uh, wrench yourself out of your habits of thinking, read the writings of Mikhail Gorbachev. This man was um, a, 
a great world statesman. He was wise. Yes, uh, he was a he was a sincere believer in in socialism. He wanted to preserve uh, the dreams of communism in the Soviet Union. His last act before he was forced out was to guide the 15 republics in the Soviet Union to pass uh, what were called uh, uh, union treaties to reestablish the basis of the relationships of these countries like Ukraine and Belarusia and Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania and Georgia and Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, all of them together, preserve them under a, a new uh, form of union. And this uh, Boris Yeltsin dis uh, destroyed. Uh, you could say, well, it's true that the people of, of those republics, just like the people of Poland and Eastern Europe, they feared the Russians. They, um, they wanted independence and freedom. This is true. But we, it's very difficult to preserve a federation. Um, it's hard to establish one. The, Fed, the Soviet Union was a federal union. The Communist Party surrendered its uh, leading role, its monopoly of power in 1990. Gorbachev arranged that. Uh, <laughs> he just persuaded them to do it. <laughs> oh my, that was the last thing we ever dreamed could ever happen in the Soviet Union and it did happen. It's the kind of thing that makes you um, love history. Uh, things happen that are, we were taught all our lives could never happen. Uh, that's still true, you know? I mean, uh, and this, the consequences of the Ukraine war could be just the reverse. Um, it depends kind of on what the Europeans do and what NATO members do. Um, If you're looking for, uh, I would urge you to read Russian history. I'm not a Russian historian, but I read Russian history in order to understand that country and its people. It is very different from America, I'll tell you that. But uh, I traveled in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. In 1987, I met Russians. I came to respect them. Miss Simon, what, what? You raise your hand, Simon. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, regarding uh, again, Mikhail uh, Gorbachev, uh, wasn't he awarded the Nobel Peace Prize? because of his actions in bringing peace to the world? I think he was, but he didn't dare to travel there to receive it for fear that there would be a coup against him. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I don't remember the details. Probably it's correct, yeah. But uh, well, he, traveled, he, traveled, he traveled to other countries, as you know, and uh, attended certain uh, funerals of leaders. Uh, together with Margaret Thatcher of Britain, for example, um, who was very fond, she was very fond of him as the person who would bring peace to the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, maybe as late as 1990, and he, he didn't uh, dare travel yeah. uh, to uh, Oslo. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a coup that August, you know, and uh, Gorbachev lasted just about another year. Uh, I was invited to the University of Moscow and gave a talk in 1995. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, when he was uh, forced to resign as president, 
of uh, the Soviet Union, why uh, he uh, established a Gorbachev Foundation, mm -hmm. and he let um, uh, the uh, the founder of CNN, uh, I forget, Ted Turner. Ted Turner. He let Ted Turner know that he um, he needed money to build a building and uh, uh, continue his work. And Ted Turner gave him, um, Ted Turner asked him how much he needed. And I've forgotten the amount, but it was something like, <laughs> something like $50 million. And uh, Turner just gave it to him. Um, and um, uh, so he's still ensconced in this uh, building and he has a little staff. I sent him a copy of my book. Um, <laughs> Uh, you talk about secret influences. So um, I don't think, you know, world federalism uh, in our time is um, still premature. But um, Gorbachev raised money for this foundation by going to the West to lecture. And now that lecture you heard in 1995, yes, it was a fundraising trip. Uh, the income from that foundation comes from his lectures abroad, uh, attended by people who respect him. Mm -hmm. Can we have another question? Sure. Um, I, I got my hand up, but I've already went. So I, I want to see, is there anyone who has not spoken yet the first time um, who would like to uh, jump in and ask a question or make a comment? Going once. Going twice. Okay, well then I'll, I'll ask my question. Oh, Virginia, go right ahead. Joseph, do you think that um, part of the problem in our world is that we have to have an enemy? Yes. Um, you know, uh, every nation state historically has needed an enemy. An enemy helps to unite your own people. Uh, the Germans are dangerous. We French have to unite and uh, so on. Right now it's, uh, well, when the United States was founded, the enemy was Great Britain. Um, if you go to the, um, you should visit Old North Bridge here in Boston, Cambridge, um, and you'll see the inscriptions written around uh, 1800. They're full of hatred for the cruel mother country, which had a, had its design upon our liberties. Um, and now um, uh, Russia is functioning as a new enemy for the uh, democracies. You know, President Biden has declared a struggle of the democracies um, against the autocracies. And it, I believe the war has already begun. And uh, I'm an old soldier and I know um, how these wars start. Um, and some say the world federalism is impossible because it would lack an enemy. Uh, if, the, if the hall of humanity is uh, can it form without an enemy, without somebody to hate? Um, my answer to that is that the enemy is not the barbarians across the border. The enemy is within us. It's our predilection for violent solutions, knockout blows, use of a bomb. It's an internal structure. I see that um, that um, Melanie. Is yes, it Melanie? right ahead, Melanie. Who? Hey, um, my goodness. Let me just get rid of this lower hand. Um, this is such a rich, amazing conversation. And as usual, Joseph, I love the fact that you are so dedicated and it's just you talking about Gorbachev and the hope of that man and, and people who have 
gone towards um, basically saving the world. Um, and I'd like to add to the mix the idea that we're not um, geared, well, yes, to get people together, there's kind of a um, recipe or there's just, like you said, I could see it coming. There's like a pattern and it's just so typical and it's the same thing every time. And I'd like to uh, offer that we can break out of that pattern. And there was a time when we didn't have as many societies that were geared towards violence about 6,000 years ago. And we still have uh, societies and a lot of people that are interested in not having war. And I would say, everyone would agree, 95% of the world's population would rather not have to worry about a bomb or you know, going outside and being hit by a sniper and things like that. So, um, the, the one thing that's changed my worldview and gave, given me hope and excitement about the future is learning about partnerism. And I've spoke to this before, and it's in a great book. It's called The Chalice and the Blade. Um, I can I'll say in the announcement something really fun later, but um, what it's offered to me is the idea that um, we are in a domination system and we don't have to be we don't have to be run by violence having you know hierarchy and in and out groups um we what what do we need besides an enemy to keep us all together is the idea that together we will survive just like in a tribal uh, uh mind thinking uh, why do i share everything that i got um all the food or whatever why are we sharing because we survive together. And that's where we are in the world. We have to survive together. And so we have to, you know, it's so easy to get triggered back into that, the thinking, even the most intelligent person will say, oh my gosh, you know, like for example, I was in a, um, I was in France as an immigrant and I was taking a free class of French and a new student came in, a Russian girl, first thing, the enemy. And just like your emotional uh, talk about these people are great. Well, yes, and we're a lot of great people and we're being pushed into, um, and I'm gonna add this to people's thoughts. It's kind of a trigger, but what about thinking the United States is run by a puppet government? Just those words are like, ah, puppet government. Ooh, ooh, how could you say that? Well run by the military industrial complex. So just throwing that out, just let it absorb. Don't think about it, don't be mad about it. But the fact is we do get tricked into these wars again and again and again, and getting on this, that person's bad, this, you know, this person's different. It just seems like the most intelligent person will get into this idea of, oh yeah, I can kill that person because they're bad and because I've been taught that they were bad. So anyway, your, your work and your, ideas are, are just so interesting and I so appreciate you being here. And the question, well, the, it's basically a comment. I just had to get that off my chest. And um, I, we, I have a couple of fun announcements for later that are happening. And also the, to cheer people up, if you haven't seen, read the book or seen the movie, the book, My Country is the World, The World is My Country movie, um, it's a way to engage people who don't think this way Oh, and we've had so many comments of people like, oh, yes, I've always felt like a world citizen, but I never had a name for it. So I think that is a huge tool that the Federalists could be using to promote, to get the word, to get people who haven't thought about that to think about it. It's a very fun movie and the book is excellent too. So that's another way to go forward and, and invite other people to this, to, to CGS and, and getting this thinking going. So. Right, thank you. And, and let me let me just cut in before you respond, Joseph, if you have a response that just as a reminder, we did read that book uh, at the book club. So most of the people here ha have read that. Mm -hmm. And through CGS, we've also shown the film mm -hmm. a few times, including at our last conference. So yes. just to remind people that that you may have ever already seen that if you don't even if you don't recognize the title. So, Joseph, anything? Do you have a response? And then we'll go on to the next person. Oh, I think it was uh, Thomas Paine who, who said, um, the world is my country and my religion is to do good. Um, 
uh, I can't quite remember, but I'm now, but uh, he also said at the, you know, after uh, writing the crisis uh, and common sense uh, to help the Americans win their revolution, the French revolution began and he left uh, the, the 13 states um, and uh, went to France saying, where liberty is not, there is my country. Um, I really have to look into uh, the chalice and the blade. Uh, Mel Melanie, uh, was there, there was a one word uh, summary of the, her doctrine. I thought you said feminism, but maybe what was another word? What was the word? Well, fem feminism is a very loaded word and I think it excludes uh, men. So what she's talking about is partnerism. Partnerism. Partner. Partnerism, yes. It's the opposite on the scale, the social scale of domination system. There's the opposite is partnerism and is really good for men. It's an excellent system for men and also women. It's an equality, nonviolent, caring. Um, everyone can break out of these uh, blocks that we're in. You know, men could be more caring and, and uh it's just a fantastic way to go. And we uh, I'll let the secret out. We're going to have Rio and Eisler on our podcast. Yeah. I'm, so so I, I, I'm needing to get the other questions and we'll have announcements in about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, Gail. But uh, I, oh, go ahead. Uh, if you have a response, Joseph. But Melanie, um, it is true that there is that feminism is defended as uh, doing just what you say. Is say that there are women who argue they're radical feminists, that if only more women were in power of, of states, that wars would uh, naturally uh, be, be rejected. Um, <clears throat> I find this hard to believe uh, when you think about people like Margaret Thatcher and, um, uh, and Hillary Clinton. Um, I would like to say one thing about this. Um, um, you spoke, you talk about togetherness and um, my shorthand way of describing this is to say that the present world system is based upon the independent sovereign state, sovereignty. Uh, you must look, find out what that means. But the opposite of sovereignty uh, is humanity. And I think we're at a stage where the sovereign state is declining and the sense of our identity as all, as members of one human race, uh, humanity is, um, is, is re replacing, humanity is uh, replacing sovereignty as a basic principle of our world organization. Um, I see that uh, a hand is up, up from uh, several people. One yes, person. we have Gail and then Carla. Okay, Gail. Um, yeah, I was uh, wondering what your thoughts are about, I raised a question in the um, email that I sent to people where I commented that the early world federalists were conservative. And I'm wondering why you thought that was the case then, but apparently is not the case now. Well, United World Federalists were conservative compared to the other Federalists of the time. For instance, um, the Chicago Committee, who were Maximus, um, and the um, Henry Osborne and the uh, Pe People's Convention people, who were revolutionaries. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> But uh, UWF, um, under Meyer's uh, guidance, uh, were quite hostile to the other groups, and because they thought they were going to uh, break, they were going to hasten the world war that uh, world government was designed to prevent. And so all these groups uh, sort of uh, um, uh, <clears throat> um, feared one another and uh, divided the movement. Um, uh, 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 Gary Davis once said of UWF, uh, 
it was just a uh, the cocktail party crowd and uh uh these people were rich and they um they um uh, met to congratulate themselves on their wisdom and they just um uh, never did anything kind of like davis um carla i'd like to hear from you because uh, i haven't heard too much from you lately I'd just like to pick up Virginia's comment and yours, Joseph, on the question of needing an enemy. For those of you who haven't looked at it, um, this topic is dealt with very well by, um, by an author named Gil Bailey. And Gil Bailey has a book called Violence Unveiled, in which he talks about the scapegoating that we resort to and picks this up from the Jewish tradition theologically, that when you want to get rid of the evil within you, you pile it on the head of a goat and then you drive the goat out into the desert to die. And that we keep repeating this pattern in choosing our enemies to try to expel what eats at us from within, which is the sense of revenge, the sense of hatred, the sense of all that is within us that keeps us from unity with each other. The, the book is very fascinating, and it is dealing with another philosopher who really uh, opened up the topic, and I, I'm not, maybe... Uh, someone can recall things hidden from the foundation of the world. Does anybody remember the author? Well, Gil Bailey picks up things hidden from the foundation of the world. That author, who is a philosopher, I think he's from Stanford in California, and Gil Bailey popularizes his deep philosophical unpacking of this scapegoating mechanism of needing to create a victim or uh, something to hate in order for us to feel healthy. So I, I just recommend that for anybody who wants to pursue that a little further. Thank you, Carla. Uh, Joseph, any responses? In uh, George Orwell's 1984, um, he describes uh, the 10, minute, 10 minutes of hate. And uh, Orwell thought that um, <clears throat> uh, this was the becoming the uh, typical uh, attitude of, of people uh, in, well, in the Cold War period. Um, uh, most people are quite polite and, uh, and reasonable, but they have little hatreds and um, Orwell thought that um, in the future, this would have to be organized and we'd have a, a little period um, in which um, everybody would uh, <coughs> recess and uh, maybe, maybe now uh, they would go into um, a room for a Zoom meeting and um, we could all just sort of look at the enemy and we could just hate him, you know, women could, um, scream and go into hysterics and men could uh, bear down and look for opportunities to enter the army and we could just we could just you know satisfy our hatreds now russia is a very good uh, example i think it's uh, this kind of a a tradition of hating of russia in the united states uh, and it's really revived lately um i don't know carla you know the scapegoat was an image for, for Christ. Uh, and the Christians uh, tried to, um, uh, do, to, to, uh, ex to, uh, uh, to draw away this, uh, this, their sin that lay within everybody uh, by, um, <clears throat> by uh, gratitude to the, for the Christ, uh, the, the, the lamb who, uh, who gave his life for uh, to redeem us from our? Um, well, I know time is short. Uh, who else would uh, wanted to 
Okay. Well, I have a second question. So is there anybody who has not yet asked their first question? Okay, Bharat? Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for thinking of me when you sent uh, uh, a PDF on books on world civilization. Uh, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, the question I have is, it's really a, a, a something that's very conflicting in my mind. If I can just preface it by saying, I grew up uh, in the surrounding where we all revered Mahatma Gandhi and uh, his just quest for nonviolence. And I always considered myself pacifist. But you know, these days when I see the pictures of young women and children and babies and others just being massacred by bombs coming in in Ukraine. And I feel like all of us in the West, I don't mean individually, I mean the countries responding to it by cheering for Ukraine and helping them. It's, but yet we are kind of like in a sideshow. Uh, I understand historically the uh, uh, aspects of the ill will towards Russia in, in terms of its perspective and so on. But under the current situation of what's going on, I'm thinking about a passage I read in, when Gandhi wrote that when you're confronted with someone of this situation, uh, you have to fight back. You just can't stand and take all the beating. And I just feel that by having this idea that, well, Ukraine is not part of NATO, so we cannot really stop this. But if we think in terms of as a human activity for you know, humanity's sake, we, we need to kind of uh, go beyond. And uh, you know, the rationale given that, oh, there might be, World War III, or there could be a nuclear proliferation if we get involved, to me are really uh, in a hocus because, you know, whatever you think of Putin, I, I don't think, you know, he's smart enough, he recognizes that all of Russia would be annihilated if there is a nuclear war. So he won't uh, work in this way, but on the other hand, by just watching the show, uh, we, we are actually not helping to uh, end this conflict. So anyway, I'm conflicted about it, especially thinking about uh, being a pacifist to uh, say that, you know, our policy isn't right and we should uh, confront this. I love to, I, I like the wisdom that comes out of you and I've appreciated this and I'd love to have you respond to it uh, uh, if you if you will okay. well, thank you you know that uh, gandhi did describe uh, satyagraha as another way of fighting uh, it requires a uh, great courage and suff and acceptance of suffering on the part of the um, protester uh, it isn't really passive resistance it's an active kind of resistance uh, but it means um, accepting suffering uh, in order to affect the conscience of the, of the, of the uh, abuser. Uh, and you, you can see that, if, you know, that film Gandhi uh, made this very vivid in the scene at the salt works when uh, the satyagrahis uh, allowed themselves to be beaten with staves. Um, <clears throat> You know, Gandhi was once asked, what should we do about Adolf Hitler? And uh, he actually argued in 19, I think it was in 1941, I seem to remember this, which is pretty much the worst point of the war. Um, Gandhi said that, well, what the, what the allies should do 
is to uh, lay down their arms and accept a Nazi uh, conquest because uh, they would maintain the, the right. And uh, in the course of time, even a, a, a Nazi order in probably most of Europe and the world uh, would uh, undergo internal transformation and um, there would be a kind of nonviolent uh, victory maybe 50 or 100 years later. And uh, the whole world has rejected this, um, this wisdom and um, even uh, Nehru in India um, after independence, um, he, he maintained the Indian army trained by the British. Uh, you, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Albert Einstein was a pacifist until um, about uh, until he fled uh, your, Germany, 1932, I think it was, or even a little bit later in 33. Um, and um, he distinguished between us, uh, 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 traditional pacifism and sound pacifism. And um, in sound pacifism, argued uh, Einstein, I quote this in the book, uh, in sound pacifism, um, we do not take a passive attitude toward global problems, uh, but uh, aim to organize power in ways that will protect the weak and the, and, uh, the free. And that's what I am. I am a sound pacifist. I, um, I don't think, uh, I, I'm not a believer in Quakerism, the uh, the the the, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, testimony, the pacifist testimony of the Quakers. I think needs to be updated. Uh, we can't just uh, say we'll do nothing. We'll just lay down and accept Hitler's new order. We uh, we must organize the world by uniting those countries that will and uh, collect our power uh, to against aggressors. I think that is wise, I do. Um, and that gets me into the uncomfortable position of saying that, well, when faced by an aggressor, we must be prepared to use force. And if it's force organized by the commonality, say the United Nations, if that could be done, which you can't, but maybe by the allied democracies of the world, we ought to do, we ought to be prepared to use force. Um, but if that means that we have to lay waste to all of Russia with nuclear war arms, I'm telling you, it won't be that simple. They will lay waste to us. I, I have this image of the earth as seen from space and I'm afraid. It's a very pretty planet. You start burning it up. It's gonna be another cinder like some of the other planets we, we've encountered rec recently. Um, Bob, would, would you yeah, like so, to ask? So we, we, we've, we've reached the end of our time. So first of all, I need to ask you, and we, we've always gone over, but I don't want to impose upon you. So my first question is, can you add another 15 minutes? We have two questions and we have several announcements. Well, I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk about my book. Okay, so uh, it sounds like a yes. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll, let, we'll add 15 minutes. I'll get uh, me and Virginia in because those are the only two hands up right now. We'll close questions then. Oh, Simon, okay, so we, we have three hands up. So I'm gonna ask each questioner to speak quickly and briefly. We, we have three questions and at least three announcements. So, um, so I'll go last. Virginia, go ahead. Joseph, we often, you and I often speak about the Baha'i concept of the most great peace and the lesser peace. 
And I'm, I'm wondering if you could clarify uh, what, what are you speaking about now? Because I stand for the most great peace. And, we, and you and I have so many, uh, uh, over 30 years, talked about this. Do you, do you stand for the lesser peace? Is that what you're clarifying here? Or do you? Yes. Can I wrote you say more about, about that? I wrote a book about the lesser peace. Well, it's in my introduction, and um, oh, it uh, it was distributed to you. Uh, I'd like to read this uh, because it, it's the clearest way to answer your question. The Baha'i faith, <clears throat> which developed in Iran after 1844, another unusual place for these things to come up, to rise up. The Baha'i faith is the only religion that teaches as a point of doctrine that world peace can practically be achieved by a political union or federal world government. Such a government will abolish war by the familiar instruments of the rule of law, which Baha'is call the lesser peace. <clears throat> but world federation will provide the minimal political, economic, and social order for the full realization of the potentialities of every human being. That is for the perfection of religion, which they call the most great peace. This is a book about the lesser peace. It's a book about practical politics. Okay, thank you. Can thank I have you. a quick question, please? Yes, I'm going to ask uh, Simon again. Okay. If you can ask your question briefly, so we can keep in our time. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you again, Joseph, very much, and Bob, very much, um, and Gail and uh, Donna. Um, and uh, regarding the Baha'is, I, I was invited twice to speak uh, in Los Angeles at the Baha'i Center, uh, and uh, you are right about their description and the Baha'u'llah. Uh, however, the Quakers, uh, though you uh, don't believe in them, they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947, the American uh, Friends Service Committee and the British Service Council jointly won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947 for their work in the First and Second World Wars in practice, in action, to bring about uh, a restitution to those who had been damaged by the two world wars. So they are a very active community, the Quakers, rather than a passive one that you described. Well, I must, uh, I must honor the recipients of these peace prizes, including the Quakers. Um, I myself am faced with um, a practical problem. I'm, a, I'm an American and um, getting to be an old man, um, but I was young once. <laughs> and I became a soldier. The purpose of a soldier is to defend the weak to risk life and limb for the weak, to defend his, his country, to defend democracy. God knows this is a terrible way to do it, but, and the soldiers I knew, 80% of them hated what they were doing. There were 10% who were gung-ho and there were another 10% who were just criminals. But the 80% did have struggled to preserve their country and establish a rough peace, a lesser peace. It's a good thing to defend America. It's worth defending. I am not able to just say, I will not have anything to do with it. I'm involved. I'm a citizen. I would like to be 
belong to another country. I'd looked at another country. I went to Israel. That was a mistake. I'm a sound pacifist. I believe in organizing power to protect us. I think the way to do this is to aim to create governments of democracies um, and, to, to, and to be prepared to, to use force uh, if attacked. I'm aware that that power is abused and I think you could not point any farther than the American government to see how we have projected power all over the world, especially since the end of the Cold War. I am fearful, but I'm not going to just stand by and say I will be morally pure and not ever lend my arms to this. I am trying to do my duty. Bob, Thank you, Joseph. Yes. So I'll, I'll take the last question and then we have Melanie's announcement and then we have a, a brief check-in around the schedule and the next book. Okay? So my question is, Joseph, you, you had mentioned that um, both in Cord Meyer's time as well as now, um, things got overwhelmed by circumstances, you know, that this, you know, delicate World Federation idea just got drowned out by the Cold War and we are threatened now with a similar situation. Um, but I wonder with certain things that are now on the horizon and specifically I'm thinking about climate change and pandemics um, that the lessons we learn from those is increased nationalism, increased isolationism is the opposite of what solves those kinds of problems. Uh, truth is about war also, but I get it that people don't see it. You know, you think if you arm yourself to the teeth, then you're safe. So that illusion still um, prevails. But in these other things, I think there's a growing recognition that, you know, with climate change, it doesn't matter how you, how much of a wall you build, you're going down if the world's going down. And it looks like with pandemics, that's a similar situation. We could be very well insulated. Another country go, ah, it's a shithole country, pardon the French. And, uh, and they get a new variant and it's over here a week later. So, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that the circumstances really are different now than they were in World War II. And we have a certain leverage, or the Cold War, I should say, we have a certain leverage now um, that we did not have then. So I, I'm just wondering, now we may still lose with all, even with all of that, but I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, that the circumstances are different in those respects. Well, that's a very good question question and it deserves a, a, a deep consideration. My, my, uh, my view is that the global problems today that are beyond this, the, the powers of single national states are uh, only multiplied from the problem I treated in my book. That, that book is about the Federalist Movement, which was particularly concerned about the uh, advent of an atomic weaponry. They didn't think much about the environment. Um, diseases were things that happened to other countries who maybe uh, didn't have a good medical establishment. Um, and one thing that's happened in the course of time is that this narrow view, the minimalist view of the 40s has been, um, it's been rejected everywhere. Uh, we can't just try to unite the world to prevent atomic warfare. That just isn't enough. And uh, there are all these questions of social justice uh, and environmental preservation um, that uh, must be addressed too. So you would think that, well, since the problems are so much greater, wouldn't the human response be so much more vigorous? 
and we don't act. We just drift. Uh, we can't find the will and the intelligence to solve these problems together. It's because we don't think of ourselves as one humanity. We're, isolationism is not dead. Every nation state which thinks is just in that same position. The United States didn't just quit isolationism and become internationalists. We're just as isolated as before and we're getting even more isolated. Uh, you know, frankly, I am in despair. I, um, I read this book by Watson headed into the abyss. He, he, he says that, well, there are some 10 different areas where we could make progress and actually the solutions are well known, but it appears that we're just not going to act in time. And he predicts that by, that by uh, 2070, these accumulated problems beyond our collective solution will uh, destroy all that remains of human civilization. And uh, he doesn't say too much about what will happen next, but I'm telling you, I'm looking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, starvation, disease, war, and death. Honestly, um, I'm completely, I'm like um, Yoder. What was his name? Yeah, Yoda, Master Yoda, Star Wars. Yeah. I don't know. It's enough that I've been defeated, but um, I do think that, um, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I appreciate your honest answer and transparency with we, where you personally are in, in all of it. Okay. So um, I, I, if there's anything further you want to say to kind of wrap up the session, um, I'll let you do it and then we'll get to Melanie's announcement and then we'll talk about the next book and, uh, and the schedule. So, so Joseph, is there anything else you wanted to say by way of closure for today or perhaps that was it? Well, I apologize for being so pessimistic. Uh, I th I'm afraid I'm waiting on events. In my view, what's happening in Ukraine um, uh, is going to determine the future. Um, I, um, um, it's, it's like the start of World War II um and um i i um i actually think we're going to know um pretty soon is uh is there going to be a wider war uh, with nato and russia um is there going to be a complete environmental collapse um and um, uh, human beings, you know, um, human beings react slowly. Um, one of my favorite quotations comes from Jean Monnet, the architect of the European Union. And Monet says in his memoirs, um, uh, <clears throat> for the hard work of uniting sovereignties, humanity will not act until faced by a crisis we are now faced with the most massive crisis, far larger than atomic bombs in 1945. Um, but we won't do what is reasonable in time. We will be forced to act. And maybe we'll have to make the, some very poor decisions. Um, I, I, and Bob, um, this will have a bearing, your, your uh, faith in the future will have a bearing on what, what you, how you lead CGS. Um, 
uh, you're going to be overwhelmed by events. And we may have to do things, uh, especially if there's a wider war with Russia, that we would never want to do. Thank you, Joseph. So I see David's hand up. I don't want to open up any further conversation. So David, do you have like a one liner that you want to say? Yeah, I just um, hoping that we can capture some way or that someone at CGS will capture the lists of books that have been mentioned because Carla May and uh, Melanie Gale have mentioned other books, even um, Professor Verrata mentioned uh, the Headed into the Abyss. You know, these are not specifically world federalist books, but relate to peace and violence and other things. So I'd love to see us, whether it's on the CGS website or somewhere, for us as activists and advocates to, to have those lists of books so we can learn more to, to make this world a better place by us knowing more. Great. That's and all. let me say to that, then, that's a logistical thing. First, right. they're all captured on the recording. So right. the recording will be on the website. And second, anyone who mentioned any books is welcome to email them to Gail and we can compile them as well. And when we send out future mailings, we can send that out in the list. So we'll have that. So thank you, David. And, and let, me, let me just respond um, to Joseph, your comment um, about me personally and, and, and you know, my own optimism and look toward the future and all that and persevering. Um, we seem to be uh, quoting a lot of other people. So I, I will quote uh, Chris Hedges um, who is a progressive journalist, former war correspondent for the New York Times and got fired uh, as a result of telling the, the atrocities that the US is doing as well, as well as other places in the world. And, and he had said, which is a, what I draw on, is he said, I, I don't do what I do because I think I'm gonna succeed. I do what I do because I think it's right. And that's, um, and that's really what I operate. I mean, my mood goes up and down. I watch the same stuff on TV we're all watching. I walk away in tears, you know? Um, yet, then what are you gonna do after that? You know, so I do what I do because I think it's right. So that, that's where I draw my, my guidance from. So, okay, so moving on. Uh, Melanie, you have an announcement. Yes, and if I could just tiny thing. So yes, it's uh, things are dire, um, but uh, without hope. I mean, if you have to, you have to visualize a good ending to move forward because you don't want to be frozen. Ah, what's going to happen? And just ah, and break down. So it's so important to visualize a great ending, just like an athlete would do. We're going to win. Okay, and then I put in the chat everything that's happening. Great stuff on partnerism. Okay. Um, you can look at, go to theworldismycountry.com slash club and it's free. You can join us and great discussion. And David Gallup's gonna be on Wednesday with the panel discussion on how we can uh, run a world with law. Dun, dun, dun. So very helpful, very helpful. And I hope to see you all there. Great, thank you, Melanie. Okay. So um, Gail and I are going to talk for a moment about both the next book, and we usually have a, a one-month break between the books. So we're going to talk about that because the break would happen in the middle of the summer. So um, does the question is the, the question is do we want to have a you know we would be we have two more sessions. We would be going then meeting in uh, May and June. Okay. So the break would normally be July, but then there's August. And maybe people want to, are well, going to be away for the summer, want to take the summer off um, and have a two month break. So, uh, Gail, I think that was the, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I stole your thunder. I think that was the question um, you were going to ask. Was there anything else around that, um, around the scheduling that you wanted to bring up? Or you just want to see a show of hands? Gail, do you hear me? Oh, yes. Um, well, I wanted to say that. Our next session will be May 14. It's the second oh, yes. Saturday of, of the month. That's, that fits our pattern at the usual time, noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And we plan to discuss chapters 20 and 22. Uh, it's a total of 37 pages. Chapter 20 is titled Henry Wallace's Challenge in the Election of 1948. And chapter 22 is World Federation in the States. 
So put that on your calendar and I will send a notice with, um, again, I'll attach those chapters, uh, PDF chapters, uh, which uh, Joseph has uh, generously uh, allowed us to, to have um, free of charge, complimentary. And then June 11 will be our wrap up for this book. Again, second Saturday of the month of June is June 11. And we'll discuss the conclusion to both volumes and Appendix F. So, and then, um, Bob, I lost my notes about the upcoming book. So if you can. Okay, fine. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll continue with the, with the break thing first, since I started that already. So the question is simple. We usually take one month in between books to give people a chance to order the next book, to begin reading it and all, and just have a break. So to, to have a, a full Saturday that you don't have to commit something, you know, commit to, uh, or co commit this to, uh, or commit to this, I'm sorry. So, um, so anyhow, so the question is, that would then um, be in July, okay? But August is also the summer and some people go away. So I think the simplest thing to do is to ask if people want to keep our, um, you know, our pattern of just missing one month the month of July, and we'll start the next book in August, or if people want to take July and August off. So I'll do a simple show of hands. How many people want to keep the pattern of only skipping one month? Raise your hand. I see well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, let me keep your hand up for a second. I want to, I got to go through my screen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven people want to just skip a month. How many people want to skip two months, July and August? Raise your hand. I see three. Okay, it looks like the one month pattern. Um, we will keep, we will stay with that. And, and of course, we're recording it. So those that want to can um, do the, you know, can see the recording and not miss anything. So Virginia, I, I see your hand up. Is it on this or another issue? Because I want to stay on this until I resolve it. It was on this issue. I was I was right. voting for two, every other month. I mean, every uh, two month break. Got it. Got it. Okay. So the the one month still has it. Um, so uh, again, those who miss the first session because they're away can still see it. So there'll be you know nothing will be missed. Okay. So the related question is the next book. So. Up until now, um, we, you know, we, we've, we've agreed several books ago that things um, just are better, deeper, richer when the author is there rather than just talking about the book without the author. So I've been continuing to focus on that. There are two or three authors that we could reach out to, but out of nowhere, for the first time, a potential author contacted me and said they heard about the book club and they would be happy to present. That person, and, and you're, you're, you'll be familiar with the ideas out of Joseph's book, um, is Joseph had talked about Clarence Streit uh, and, and the organization um, or the book that he wrote is called Union Now. Uh, he's no longer alive, but his organization lives on, the Streit Council, and, the, um, and they have come up with, one, they're one of the groups, actually the only one before World War II that came up with the substantive model of what a world federation might look like and a proposal for how to get there. It was actually intended to head off World War II. Um, but anyway, the head of the strike council, a woman by the name of, uh, and, and uh, Joseph, I know you know her. She told me that you know each other, if I'm pronouncing her name wrong, uh, Tiziana Stella. Uh, she's Italian, but living in Washington, DC, running this organization. And she has uh, volunteered to be the next uh, author um, and going through uh, Streit's book, Union Now. So, that is, um, so that's an offer right there. Two other possibilities that I was going to reach out to um, are Andreas Bummel, who I know many of you know, his book on World Parliament, um, and Chris Hamer, who some of you may have been familiar with from our last conference, who also wrote a book a little older uh, than Andreas's on a world parliament. But their time zones are such that 
they both not may not be available. So I, I, I just wanted to um, let you know that my inclination, unless people have a, you know, sh a strongly opposing view, um, is to go ahead and accept the offer uh, to read Union Now, which is a significant seminal book uh, for the movement. And, uh, and I will continue to then negotiate with the other two folks uh, to see if we can work something out in spite of the time zones. So I'll just open the floor if there are any questions, comments, or agreements or disagreements with that, because that, that would be a, a very natural thing to do. Okay. Okay. Applause. Uh, applause. Okay. Barat, you have a comment on that? Well, I support your uh, uh, recommendation of the uh, first, first recommendation for the book. That's all I have to say. Oh, okay, great. Well, then let's do, do a quick thumbs up if you're in support of me proceeding and booking Tiziana. Um, okay, thing, a lot of thumbs. Okay, as they say, we're all thumbs. Okay, so, um, so let me then turn to Gail to see if there are any other logistical things that we need to wrap up for today. I can't think of anything. Terrific. In that case, I will give you all back your um, Saturday and um, up column A, you have a last word. Oh, okay, you're just waving goodbye. Okay, I will give you all back your Saturday. Very, very much want to uh, extend our, our deep appreciation to Joseph uh, again for coming here. Um, you know, not only sharing his wisdom, but sharing his heart, uh, very much so. And um, I'll invite uh, Gail and Joseph, if you want to stay on another moment for, to debrief. And to everyone else, I'll say see you next month. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, and I will close the recording. Just uh, seeing you, Tom, reminds me. Right. That's why I'm trying to remind you. Thank you.